I need your help. How many of you actually enjoy tribulations? It's going to help me with my, like, how, how many? Uh, raise your hands. You enjoy tribulations. Uh, put it another way, conflict, um, opposition. Anything ring a bell? Enjoy? No? Okay, next question. This is going to really help me, uh, so please. How many of you want to be complete, lack in nothing? Whoa. Let me see that. Let me see that. Okay. Everyone. Okay, so let me get this straight, right? We don't want tribulation, but we want everything, right? Okay, I have a problem. Let's go to James. James chapter... Oh, let, let me just pray very quickly. Father, um, in your name, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O God. Amen. Okay, this is the problem. James chapter 1 verse uh, 2. I'm going to read it very slowly. Consider it all joy, my brethren. I would assume that's us. When you encounter various trials. Bit problem. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let that endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Oops. Do you see the problem? Yeah. So that, that's, I think that's why we want to study Nehemiah. Because I think in Nehemiah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through this, right? We're going to learn something, and it's a, it's a great principle. Um, and I'm going to start with this. Oops, sorry. I want us to see the awesomeness of God, because I, I want us to actually recognize that this problem actually is a problem of relationship. And what I mean by that is... Um, how many of you, uh, has your wife just turned around recently and said, I love you? Has someone told you they love you in the last two days? Oh, okay, some of you haven't, <laughs> but that's fine. But what happens in your heart when say, someone says, I love you? You either believe them or you don't, right? So here's the other problem we have, right? God says that he loves us. I think we had communion. Pastor Alan said, well, for God, so God loves you, right? That's like sense of communion. So the other problem we're having is like, um, do we believe that? Well, then how come we get trouble? Uh, how come uh, when we look at Nehemiah in a shortly, um, how come he's the one that causes this problem, right? I mean, think about it. We did Nehemiah chapter 1, 2 so far, and it seems like it was God that started it all, right? Okay, so, so perhaps it's a, it's a different conversation. What if it's about relationships? So, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 7. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, it actually says something really interesting. It is for discipline that you endure. God's, uh, God deals with you as sons. For what... Son is there whom his father does not discipline. And suddenly the conversation changes, isn't it? What if it's not about because you did wrong? What if it's about because I love you? So I'm a father, right? I mean, and for those of you who are fathers, you want the best for your child, right? And when the word discipline is actually to correct. And why do you correct? What do you correct? Love, right? So, so let's, let's go through this, right? So, so okay, uh, let's hear about God's love for us. Like, like, really? Is that true? And, and then there's this concept of building somehow. Like, every time we go into the Bible, there's some kind of build, right? So, so we're talking about building the wall. We're talking about building Jerusalem. What's this thing about building anyway? So let's, let's kind of go into it a fair bit. So far, we're at, we're at this point of a journey where I'm kind of like thinking, hmm, this is going to be interesting. So when, when I went back and I kind of looked like, what's actually happening? And I, I'm not sure if you can see this clearly, but it's got this whole timeline, right? There's a timeline of the United Kingdom, which is basically when Saul was the king and, and David was the king and everything was supposed to be great, right? 
It's the height of the thing. King Hezekiah builds this massive, massive temple, and Jerusalem was at the height of it all. Everything seemed great. Then what happened? Well, actually, there was Solomon first, right? <laughs> After Solomon died, what happened? You had the divided kingdoms. Why? Conflict, right? What was the conflict? The conflict was, well, well Solomon wanted, uh, well, actually, his son wanted to rule, and, and, and then he had this problem because he wanted to tax them more. And the rest said, no, that's not happening. We're going to divide. End of story. Then you've got this, this thing at 606 uh, where, where they're basically conquered by the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And what you find to be true is this, this whole so, somewhat kind of like a train wreck waiting to happen, right? But, but why? I, 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 this has got to be explained, right? Otherwise, how does it make sense? How can God kind of love you and makes you into a train wreck. It's just not right, right? So, so let's go back. Let's go back. Why is this happening? Deuteronomy 28.44. So if you look at Deuteronomy 28.44, you have this really interesting line, which, uh, which says, here we go. Uh, maybe not. 49, sorry. The Lord will bring you a nation against you from afar, um, from the end of the earth as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation fierce and countenance, who you will have no respect for old, nor show favor for the young. You know what that was? That was a consequence of a disobedience. So, so Deuteronomy 28 actually shares this point of view that God will bless. But it also says if you don't, that's what's going to happen. So we're in this tail end of this story right now in, 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 in Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, Daniel, all had this, this, whole, um, this whole idea of what's going to happen. Because God told Daniel, look, this is going to happen to you. But in that 70th year, uh, you'll be exiled for 70 years and then you'll come back. And this timeline is important because we're right at Nehemiah, you see 444. Why is that all so important anyway? Let me see. Because actually, Nehemiah started the clock. It was not just the wall. And this is so important because, um, as you will see, we're looking at the God of the universe, right? And he has a plan for us, and we know that. But, but what we didn't understand was um, Nehemiah started the clock. And what, what, does that, what do I mean by that? Um, there is a prophecy. There was a prophecy was basically um, Daniel 9. How many of you are familiar with that? Daniel 9? Yeah? What was the prophecy? The prophecy was basically that when Jerusalem is built, 70 weeks from that point, the Messiah will come. So the question becomes, when was Jerusalem built? Was it the temple? Was it the idea of the temple? Or was it all of Jerusalem? And really, the timeline was all of Jerusalem. So when does all of Jerusalem start? When Nehemiah decides to go build the wall. Right? Now, here's what's exciting. And here's, here's the interesting thing. The prophecy goes on to say that at that point, um, when the Messiah comes, right, um, there's going to be a revelation. He will be taken away, and then the city will be destroyed again. The city will be destroyed again. So when was the city of Jerusalem destroyed again? By the Romans, 70 AD, which means the Messiah had to come before that, right? And guess what that means? Guess what that means? The Messiah has come, right? What does that mean for you and me? I wonder what, what Nehemiah must have felt, right? Did, I, don't, I don't know, but it took him four months from Susa going down to, to Jerusalem. I wonder if he knew he was going to start the timeline. And I think my question to you today is, I, w I wonder if you recognize what timeline God has for you. I don't think you're here by mistake. I don't, I don't think you're 
just sitting here because you're here. I think God has a destiny and a plan for you. And that's what we're going to... That's what we're going to unfold full today. Jesus is that king. Jesus is that king who came and the Messiah that was born for us. But right now, if I want to go back and look at Nehemiah, I want to, I want to just kind of go through a couple of things that we did learn. We learned that Nehemiah was a cub bearer, right? We knew that he actually had, um, in distress, he called out to God, and the king basically said, okay, I am going to, um, I'm going to really release you. Do you know something interesting about this king, though? This king was the king that actually stopped the temple from being built in the first place. Or rather, um, just before that in Ezra, you read that this is the same king that stopped the whole process of Jerusalem being built. The other thing that we'll recognize and notice is the king himself... Um, when, um, when he's conducting his affairs, he's actually conducting a he, he's actually conducting the affairs of an entire, in those days, almost the world. Imagine it's like um, from one end of almost India all the way across to Turkey, all the way down. That's a massive piece of land, right? And so he's the boss of boss. He's like, imagine, I don't know, who can you think of? You know, that the bosses of all bosses. And, and imagine if you have to go to that bosses of bosses and, and tell him that you suddenly feel like you need to do something against what he stopped in the first place. Because you've got to tell him that actually he made a mistake in the sense. You want him to reverse whatever you're saying. So do you think you'd be afraid? I mean, this guy could kill you. This guy could really just damage you, right? So that was the fear that, that Nehemiah had. So can you imagine when he walks up there, and you, and you read this in chapter one, two, uh, chapter 1, and he goes up, and the king asks, why are you sad? This is an interesting thing, because he's never been sad. That's interesting, right? Like, why are you sad? Your heart must be heavy. And he goes like, what does he do? He prays immediately. He goes like, okay, I'm going to die, right? You know? But if I'm going to die, let me just say something nice before I die, right? He goes like, well, how can I not be sad if... It's almost like he's asking the king a question back again. He's not responding to the king. He's asking the king to think for himself, which is really quite smart, right? I mean, you think of it. Wisdom. And you'll find this to be true with uh, Nehemiah across the thread. And I want you to, to bear that in mind. So, so we've done that. Um, then we've realized that he's actually gone to Jerusalem and he does something interesting. He gets to go. We find that he, he, he is able to actually get into Jerusalem on his own. But what does he do, first of all? Does he go and, and kind of like, hey, I'm here. God told me this. Come on, let's go and build a wall. What does he do? Surveys, right? It's, it's kind of like, this guy's a good planner, man. He's very strategic. Didn't say a word. And why did he do that? He did it at night. Do you remember that? He, he actually did it at night. Why do you think he did it at night? Because he, he wanted to be stealth. He didn't want the enemies to find out what's happening. He wanted to survey what needed to be done. Then, then he comes out, and who does he talk to? He talks to everyone, and he says, look... Here's what I think we need to do. And, and he rallies them up. Uh, and they say, let's build a wall. So uh, last week, I think we heard Pastor Allen, he talked about how the wall was built by different groups of people. Yeah? I thought there was one interesting thing in the grouping. Um, do you know, the, the first group to start was the priest, right? The next group was the men of Jericho. Do you know what's so interesting about that and how God uses it? So the priests were the highest kind of like, you know, your king's priest, right? They start, right? Do you know who the men of Jericho were? If you remember way back, Jericho was destroyed. And God actually put a curse on Jericho. So the cursed men worked with the princely men. How good is God? What does it say to us? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are, what status. So I just thought that was really, really interesting. Today, though, 
we're going to talk about the opposition that faced Nehemiah. Now, now, I started off by saying, look, opposition is good, right? In that sense, right? We should rejoice in opposition. Uh, but is that really true? And you know, how did, how did Nehemiah handle this, right? So let's look at the opposition themselves. So that was ridicule. Basically, uh, you really think you can do this? How many of you have faced that every time? Who are you, right? You know, do you think you're good enough? Um, you're so not worth it, right? Violence is interesting. Violence is like, okay, I'm going to hit you so you don't do this, right? Um, rage, road rage, one, in, one example. Uh, complaints from within. Now, this is your own team going like, well, I don't think we can do this, boss. No. I know what you're saying, but no, we can't do this. I mean, some of you are on projects where they say one thing and you get up doing another, right? <laughs> um, false accusations. But you told me something and you, you accuse someone of something else, trickery, intimidation. So that's, does that happen still today? I think that was the point I'm trying to make. Yes, right, we can agree. So can we learn something from Nehemiah? Okay, so that's what we're going to address today. But I've got the 4 P strategy of Nehemiah. Okay, I'm just going to bring it up front. And we're going we're gonna to examine whether this is true. So the 4 P's, passion for God. What does that mean? He loved God. He, he was like, I'm going to do this because of God, right? That was the pursued God's way. What does that mean? Well, there's my way and there's God's way. What's my way? My way is I'll do what's convenient, right? What's God's way? Someone slaps you on the cheek, what do you do? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, turn the other side. Oh, that doesn't sound like very helpful. <laughs> Oh, nice, right? Uh, play to win. Now, how, how many of us actually understand this? I mean, we play the game, but do we play to win? What's the difference? One says, I, I am determined to succeed, irrespective, right? And when you play to win, how do you, what's your attitude? Doesn't matter what it is. I, I got to do this, right? If you're not playing to win, what happens? You kind of go like, it's okay, la. Right? Just another day. Yeah, you know, we'll live to fight another day, it's okay. And, and the other bit would be, yeah, but maybe it's not God's will. Maybe it's not God's will. Do you, do you think this opposition was God's will to begin with? Yeah, that would be another interesting question. And he prayed always. What does that tell you about when he says he prayed always? Relationship. Like, you must have a relationship if, you, if you're going to talk to someone. Like, if you don't have a relationship, you cannot talk to someone. Yeah? We're going to go very quickly on this one. So, Nehemiah 4. It starts off with the idea of the enemies trying to stop him by ridicule. And you'll notice something, right? Um, in most cases, most all cases... The first point of attack is really ridicule. Think of Jesus. Um, think of the, uh, the temptation. What was the first thing that the devil, Satan, said to Jesus? If you are the son of God. Is that a form of ridicule, right? <laughs> if you are, uh, I mean, please, if you are. Um, this is the number one thing that comes against all of us today. Do you really think of uh, can you really do it? Who are you to do it? What was Nehemiah's response? He didn't have one. He almost, no, actually, not even almost. He didn't even think of it that way. He kind of said, well, I've got work to do. Let me pray. And what did he focus on? The task at hand. The focus was not on the problem, on what you're saying. The focus was at the task at hand. And I think this is really important for us to recognize um, because most of the time I think we focus on our opposition. And this is, um, I don't think it's a bad thing in that sense because we are always told, right? Like, 
Let's, let's look at what's not happening right and let's fight that, right? But it's interesting, Nehemiah didn't do that. He didn't do that. He just said, okay, I need a work to be done. I'm going to pray and, and I'm going to move on. Uh, so they built the wall. Now, they built the wall till halfway point, right? At this stage, guess what happens? You, hey, it should be done, right? Nope. Um, something else happens. Now, people get upset. The wall is there. It's halfway through. But two people get very furious. They get very furious at him because they're saying, well, how can this be? You know, how can this actually be? So what do they do? They actually had a, a conversation and they started accusing. They started putting up the pressure. And as they put up the pressure, you had someone in camp as well. You had Judah going like, well, this is getting too difficult. The heat starts going up. And then Judah um, kind of goes like, well, you know, it looks like we've got a lot more rubbish. We've got a lot more stuff to do. This is not working out. Now, here's what's interesting. The tribe of Judah, if you can remember that, the tribe of Judah is actually the, the tribe of the lion, right? It's the one that has the greatest strength. It's interesting that it's the tribe of Judah that gave up first. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think that's the case? I, I have a theory, okay? My theory is simply this, because they are the ones that can actually, because they're rulers, right? I mean, they, they have a sense of the task ahead, right? They, they, they know what it takes to win. Um, I have a theory, and my theory is like, you know, they were so discouraged at that point, they wanted to give up. So discouragement was the, was the other thing that happens when you, when you start uh, getting there. What happens then? The challenge from the outside, the enemies, became more intense. And I think one of the things that... that you will recognize in Nehemiah's uh, journey was that it never got easier. It never got easier. Now, I'm going to go back and say this to you. I'm, 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 I'm convinced that part of our journey of life is not about whether the wall gets built even, I think. I think it's the understanding that these are challenges that will happen. And as we grow, as we build, as we you know, as we establish our wall, we should expect it to get harder. It's almost like when you go to school, at, if you're in, um, let's say you start off in, in, in primary school, right? Two plus two, was that hard? Pretty hard, right? And, and suddenly you got 20 times 20. You kind of go like, that's not possible in standard one, right? And, but in standard, if you're in university, and if someone asks you 20 times 20, are you expected to know? I feel that on our, Christ, uh, on our Christian journey as well. I, I think this is one of the occasions where I kind of see it being squeezed even more. I, I see that, you know, the wall gets done. The, 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 there's this whole idea of adversary. They neither know nor see anything. This is an attack, right? Um, and basically what happens is these people kind of say like, Let's go attack them. Let's go kill them, you know? And you know what God does? He gives them information, not through him, through other Jewish people who actually stays in that area. So what he does is he says, well, you know, these guys are going to attack you, like forewarning. And here's my thing for you. Um, I don't think God never gives you a pre-warning. Like you know it from your friends, you'll know it from your you know, wife, mostly your wife, I think. No, honestly, I think they know, and they'll tell you, look, I don't think it's a great idea. You know, I, I really think he should. But you know what we do? What do we normally do? So this is why Nehemiah is really a wise builder. He actually listened, right? What did he do? In, in the next slide, you'll see that. Um, it was, he, God allowed that to be, uh, the attack to be forewarned. And then what he did was, he organizes it. I think where we fall most of the time, we, we understand an attack is going to come, but do we organize? Do we think about it? Do we not do anything? 
I think chances are we'll say, look, look, the attack come because I'm strong, right? But not. Nehemiah actually decided, look, you know, we need to organize. We need to make sure what's not working. We need to somehow uh, ensure that the people who are working continue to work. Uh, the guys that are, you know, need, we need to defend ourselves. We cannot let this stop. This is playing to win, by the way. If you were not playing to win, what would you do? Okay, let's back up, guys. We'll wait for a better time, you know. It's too tough. Maybe God's not with us. Maybe not God's not with us. Do you think that was the case? Because I, I, I recognize that a lot of times when, when the heat happens, the number one thing we say is, well, maybe God's not with us. Maybe God does not want us to succeed. Maybe it's not God's plan. Have you heard that one? Because I haven't heard from God. Have you noticed, did, did Nehemiah hear from God? But he knew God was in the plan, right? He must know. How did he know? He prayed, but he also trusted the word. He knew because God had said that the walls of Jerusalem must be built for the Messiah to come. Did he want the Messiah to come? Of course he did. So was he in God's plan? Yes, he was. Do we trust what God's word says, even if we don't hear him? I think that's a good question to ask. You know, I mean, it really is a, a case where it's incredible. There was no voice from God. That, how do you know what to do? And I think it's, it's, a, it's a great place for us to kind of almost reflect and go like, you know, I wonder, I'm halfway through my job right now, whatever challenge you're facing, uh, to maybe reassess. And I would... I would argue God never put you in that situation for you to quit. Unless, and remember Deuteronomy 28, right? Unless you're there because you disobeyed to begin with. And then it's correction. Correction is different from punishment. In a relationship, you never punish. You correct. Right? So God never punishes us as Christians. But he corrects this. So I'm going to move on. So the enemies, guess what they do? What does the enemy do now? Shrink back. So you will notice, right, and, and I, I say this in most cases, you will notice in every step of the, any story you read in the Bible, there's this huge emphasis on show of power, there's a lot of talk. And then when it comes down to it in the battle, unless it's not God's hand in it, they withdraw. It cannot, nothing can stand against the power of God. And that it's true back then, and it's true today. Now, just when you think everything is going well, just when you think, okay, we've got it, it's all good. Heard this one? Financial trouble. How did this happen? So this is a crazy, crazy story, okay? Um, so what had happened was a lot of people who were working in Jerusalem uh, took out loans because they couldn't afford food. And they took loans from fellow Jewish people, right? Uh, who were rich. And when they couldn't pay they would sell their daughters or wives as slaves. Now, do you think that was right? In God's laws, was that even correct? No. So what had happened was they were doing things incorrectly. Now, I don't know if they recognized what they were doing or otherwise, but this is a situation where we keep doing things incorrectly. Right? I mean... You think about it, there were, there were two situations, right? One, the situation of, well, I didn't have enough money, let me borrow, and I know it's wrong to pay to these guys, but I'll do it anyway. The other is the person who's lending to you is doing something wrong, right? So if everybody is doing wrong, it's okay. Until, what happens? When they're building the wall, when doing something important, the issue comes up. So it's dormant until you're doing something important, is what I read from that. And then suddenly, it's a problem. Uh, and then what happens? Nehemiah does something interesting. 
Nehemiah does not go and yell at the at, at, at the guys, and he gets all upset. If you if you read this, see that first word after serious thought. Isn't that incredible? Because I can I can imagine he must have been really upset. Actually, he was. If you read the, the verses before that, he was actually very upset. How many of you, when you're seriously upset, don't have a serious thought after that? Because you're clouded. You know, it's impossible to have a serious thought. And, and yet, in there, I mean, that's incredible, right? How did you do that? Like, so imagine this. Under stress, under pressure, you've got a job to do, now you got this. And it's not even, you know, they should be doing better, right? He addresses it by talking to the people who are causing the problem. I think it's so difficult, on the other hand, as well, to, to kind of think about it in a different way. But I'm going to say this. If you know something is wrong, how many of us actually have the courage to speak truth in love? It would have been easier for Nehemiah to just come up with an addict and just tell them, look, you're wrong, and let's get on with this, right? But what did he do? He had a serious thought, and he said, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. And he convicts them. He convicts them. He does not try to argue about right. He just tells them, look, this is, this is it. And they're convicted. And then he says something really interesting. He calls the priest and he says, if, you, if you're serious about this, make an oath. And I'm going to, you know, um, there was a thing in, in, uh, when Jesus told the disciples to, to shake off the dust off the feet. It's there. If you read, um, this, is, this is what he says, he says right? He says, they're not walking. Restore now. This is what he says. Those are powerful words. When you think of it, right? You have to think about how he phrased that. Isn't that amazing? When I read that, I thought, well, that's a man of wisdom right there. So let's talk about Nehemiah's character in a way, because chapter 6 is really about his character. You get to know what he's like. Um, so Nehemiah actually was not just a cupbearer when he came to Jerusalem. The king made him a governor. Now, as a governor, you actually get what they call, um, I, I guess, you get to tax people. But he could eat. You know, the, he, he, he hosted 150 people every day for a banquet. So can you imagine? He had servants. Um, but, but he says that um, he didn't take advantage of any of that. Oops, sorry. At my table were 150 Jews. Can you see that? The man had a lot of money, I guess. Well, not guess, I know. And, and I, I love this phrase at the end of it. He says, remember me, my God, for the good that I have done to your people. Now, this is an interesting phrase because some people can look at it and say, well, that's kind of arrogant. You know, you're saying, remember me because I'm doing good, like I'm getting repayment. But I wonder if his relationship with God is actually different. I wonder if he's saying, look, God... I, I want you to, to remember, you love your people. I'm loving them because I love you. I wonder if that's what he's saying. Because you love, I love. And you know what's interesting? We love because he first loved us. Now, this is the interesting thing. So, so far we've seen attacks across for the people, right? What is the final one? Let's attack the leader. If it doesn't work with discouragement, if it doesn't work with everything else, right? This, this accord inside and all of that. Finally, we'll get to the man. Let's get, let's get him. 
Because you take the leader away, you get everybody else, right? So what did they do? They were like, snap enemies' friendship. They pretend they're friends. <laughs> Can you imagine? What did, what did Nehemiah do? And if you read, he refused to come down because he says, look, I've got work to do. Sorry. Be careful who you're yoked with. You know, do not be unequally yoked. There's a reason for that. Do you know why? Because as Nehemiah knows, does your enemy actually want you to succeed? So you've got to be thinking about that, right? Does he, is he interested for your success? And then who is? Slander? Scandal? All of that, and he completes the wall. He completes the wall in 52 days. By the way, do you know how long it took for them to complete the temple without the walls? 20 years. So that is incredible. That's like instant noodles in 30 seconds. No, that, that's, that's reality, right? So, question. Let's look at this. Did we see his passion for God? He was doing what God wants him to do. He always prayed to God. He kind of like, look, you know, for God, right? There's a, there's a passage in there. He said, I'm doing all these things because I fear God. Now, the idea of fear God in his mind is not, I'm afraid of you. It's like, I respect you like a father is respected. Like when I come to the table, I want you to eat first, Father, because I, I love you and I respect you, right? You will hear that. Pursued God's way. Did he? Did he do it his way? So his way might have been, let's ignore the Jewish nobles who are giving money. Let me, from my own pocket, give money. Maybe we'll hash up a deal. Or did he do it God's way? God's way. He played to win, right? 52 days. You've got to be playing to win to get 52 days, right? You have to. And he prayed always. Every step of the way, you'll hear him pray. I, I, I submit to you that that's a great strategy. That's a fantastic strategy, right? That's a great way of overcoming. And we've learned that overcoming is actually... Trials are not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And if you overcome your trials, guess what happens? You become perfected. You lack nothing, right? So what's the lesson from Nehemiah so far? Can we, can we surmise that God loved Nehemiah? Now, can I agree or can we agree that actually Nehemiah went through a lot? Right? But we can still agree that God must love Nehemiah, right? Because guess what? In the scheme of things, he entrusted Nehemiah to start the clock. Without Nehemiah, there was not going to be Jesus coming through the gates at all. God must have really loved him. Yeah? Nehemiah was also a builder. But here's what I want to submit. It's not an ordinary builder. Because anybody could have built, right? He was a wise builder. And the way he built it was, I think, Extraordinary. I cannot think of a better way of putting, uh, I'm sure he may have thought of it. I cannot understand, oh, I'm really impressed that there was a, there was a priest and then there was, there, was, there was the guys from Jericho next to each other. I wonder if it was so that the priest can see, hey, the guys of Jericho are not too bad. And the guys from Jericho can go like, hey, maybe I'm good enough to be here. It's amazing. Nehemiah had a good relationship with God. Can we agree on that? He must have, right? How else could he have said, I am not going to tax these people. I trust God. He will provide for me. He must have said that. Do you know he was governor for 12 years before he went back to, to, um, back to the king? 12 years. Can you imagine how much money he could have made? Because he only did the wall in 52 days, right? Right? But you know, he did it because the relationship he had with God was more important than money. My question, how much, how much, 
What would you have done if we were in Nehemiah's place? If we were the governor for 12 years, and think about it this way, right? You've got a multinational job, you're the CEO of the company, and now you've got a $20 million salary. But because of your relationship with God, you may not make another $5 million. Would you do it? That was Nehemiah. But then, what's that got to do with me today? Because we established that God loves Nehemiah, right? I'm going to look at these challenges and I'm going to try to say, look, are we facing the same ones? Because if it is, then, then maybe there's something we can do about this. So the first one, this is true today, right? I, I, need, I need my daily needs met. Yes? Was that familiar to us? Nehemiah 5. They worry about it, right? Today, we, we still worry about these things. This is a challenge for some people, especially in today's time and age. You know, some, some of you may be wondering whether you'd have a job. Can you even get a job? Some of you, right? I mean, some of you graduating, and it's like, well, I don't know if I've got a job tomorrow. That's real. I feel discouraged. I've put out all the applications. I've got a job, but, you know, my boss always makes me feel terrible. I'm not happy. I'm discouraged. I feel alone, helpless, no one seems to care. This is the case of Nehemiah 4, where, where some of them are saying, look, I'm helpless, I've got money to pay, my wife is being taken away, I feel so dis- there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Do we face that today? I think more than ever, there's, that a lot of people are struggling with this one, particular one. I cannot escape doing wrong things. Everybody does it, so, so I must. Everybody pays a bribe, so I must. Everybody does it this way, so I must. Everybody yells at each other at the office, so I must. You know, if I don't shout louder, that guy shouts louder, he gets it, so I must. Right? It's okay to do wrong things, because it's work. We've established that Nehemiah actually was doing work, right? He was the governor of the region. Not just Jerusalem, mind you. Huh? It's the governor of the region. There's no meaning what I do. And this is a tough one. Are you in a meaningful job and a meaningful relationship? It's the biggest question we're we're challenged with today. And I think it comes down to this question, does God care about you? If we honestly sit down and ask that question, then you might have all these different thoughts in your head, right? Well, God might care about maybe somebody else in the church because, look, he's driving the Mercedes-Benz, but I'm taking the MRT, you know, and I trust God as well. Well, I've trusted God, you know, I've tied it to him, but guess what? I still have high blood pressure. Hey, but you know, does God really care? You know, I I tried everything I can, but my wife wants to walk out on me today. Does God care about me at all? He may care about his big plans. He may care about the Nehemiah. He may care about Pastor Ellen because he's so, you know, 5.30 can get up, right? (laughs) But I can't get up at 5.30. Does God care about me then? No, right? Here's the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, can I repeat that? Whosoever, can I repeat that again? Whosoever, that's you, believes in him. Here's key. Do you believe in him? Shall not perish. What does perish mean? get destroyed, your walls don't get built, your life is a disaster, there is no meaning, but have eternal life. God loves you because he has a relationship with you, the same way he had a relationship with Nehemiah. Question is, do you believe him even though you don't hear him the way you think you should hear him? That's Nehemiah. Do you think he heard God the way you and I think we should hear God? And why couldn't he? He didn't have the Holy Spirit, did he? He 
didn't have the promise of the Messiah, did he? Yet this man could believe God for that. The most important thing before we even talk about anything else is that we've got to believe that you, you have a relationship with God. And I say relationship in the context of God loves you first. It's like this, you know, Pastor Alan talked about the Korean drama, but it's this relentless love that God has for us that did not stop. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this next slide because it is this. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Let me ask you a question. Um, some people would buy a really fancy house for a million and a half dollars, right? Well, maybe that's not very fancy in Singapore. Maybe I've... <laughs> Okay, Sentosa Cove. If someone offered you a house in Sentosa Cove for $1 million, how many of you would buy it straight away? Well, not many. <laughs> if I reduce the price. <laughs> $500,000 Sentosa Cove with waterfront. Right? Why? Oh, maintenance expensive, but value for money, right? So we value things by the amount of money we pay for something, right? Here's the question. How much do you think God valued you if we base it on the price he paid for you? So what is the price he paid for us? So uh, Pastor Alan showed it just now that Jesus, he said, remember the cross. What was that? His blood was shed for us. So his life was given for us. What is the price of Jesus' blood? What is the price of Jesus' blood? Can you pay for the blood of Jesus? That's how much you're worth. I want you to let that sink in for a minute because that is massive. If you truly know how much he paid for you, and I'm not talking about you because you are special. I'm talking because he first loved you. It's not because you're special. It's not because you have you know, all these great talents. You've got to believe that he came first because he said, I want them. It's like the Korean drama I was talking about. This beautiful, handsome guy or girl, depending if you're a guy or girl, comes after you and you can't understand why. Honestly, right? No, imagine that, like some real superstar comes up to you and go like, I want you, and you're going like, why? Like, I cannot understand it. And I think that's our biggest problem with God. We cannot understand why God would want someone like us. Like, why would God want me? What can I do for him? But it's not about you, my friends, my brothers. God just loves you. And I think once we, and, and I think that's, you know, we, we talked about the greatest challenge. One of the greatest challenge is this uh, ridicule. The devil does that on you when he says, actually, uh, who are you? Who are you? Who are you that God will love you? Look at the times you've always messed up. Here's my encouragement for you. How many times have Israel messed up? Countless, right? Has God given up on Israel? Why? Covenant relationship. Do we have a covenant relationship with God today? Yes. We just had that covenant relationship when we had the communion, right? With God, His covenant is important. With God, His covenant is, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. That's how strange it is because we don't believe God. That doesn't stop God from believing in himself, does it? So I think this bit is so central in our walk, in our challenge. Be a wise builder. I think that's the next step. Once you, once you can accept that God loves you, right? That you are loved, that you are, <laughs> you are in his plan. Period. It does not... Look, I know people talk about feelings, like when someone loves you, you can feel it, right? Right? And you may, you may not understand it sometimes, 
But I guarantee you, a baby doesn't feel love when it's a small, tiny thing. Perhaps the reason why we don't feel God's love is because we're still spiritually babies. And that's okay. Right? As long as we can feed and eat on His Word, we're fine. We will grow. And when we grow, we will, we will learn how to love Him back. And that's okay. So I wouldn't knock yourself if you feel like, well, but I, I can't, I can't, it's okay. But I can't drink on His Word. Grow. So here's a good thing. We need to be wise builders. Why would we say that? Um, this is the key one, right? I, I love this one. Therefore, whoever hears those sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. This thing about building comes back again. This is Jesus, right? And rain descended and floods came and winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall. Can you see opposition here again? What does Jesus tell us? Will opposition come? So it shouldn't be a surprise to us if opposition comes, right? But what does he say instead? Did he say, focus on the opposition? Okay, build, uh, you know, he said build your house, right? You know what's interesting about that? He didn't say build a wall, build something else, right? He said build your house. The question becomes, what is your house? Do you know what your house is? Do you want to take a guess? That's a hard one, right? Build your house. Okay, this one's got a worst for it, if I can find it. Actually, I can. And it's actually in Hebrews. Okay, Hebrews 3. Chapter, uh, verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. Whose house we are? What does that mean? We are his house. So when Jesus said, build your house on him, what is he saying? Build you on him. Be a wise builder and build you on him. That's what he's declaring. So, so the question is, what is your hope built on? That's the real question. Is your hope built on anything else but Jesus? Because if it is, guess what's going to happen? Because I guarantee you, there's going to be challenges. Do you, I, I, I don't mean to demean any situation, right? But our world history has gone through some really, really turbulent times. But there is a prophecy. And the prophecy is in Daniel. You know that five kingdoms, this big statue? And the first was Nebuchadnezzar. And you can read it up, Daniel 4. I think it's a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. And there was a... You know what crushed that whole entire empire? It, it represented the empires of the world. It was a tiny stone, right? And it was thrown against that big thing. And, and it, that small pebble became a mighty mountain. You know what the, uh, the, fairy, the prophecy was about? You know what that, that small pebble turned out to be? The kingdom of God. We're in the kingdom that's going to grow. Amen. And you got to know that. You see all these kingdoms come and go? Are they still around? No. But the kingdom of God will last forever. So, what is your hope built on? Build your house on the rock. It means believe what Christ is saying is true. It means thinking about the right things. I think the first place, and we've talked about this along the way, right? But the first place he's going to attack is what? Your thoughts. Why? Because if he can get your thoughts, he can take away your belief, right? And the way he does that is words. It's, it's, it's words. If he could do it with Jesus, like 
think about it from the very start. What was the first thing that happened to Adam and Eve? Everything was great. And then the first thing that happened was a conversation, a doubt, right? So when you think about this, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, praise, think about these things. Possible? Maybe not, right? Maybe not, right? I mean, that's great in theory, but can we do it? My premise is you cannot do it without Jesus. You cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. You've got to have a relationship with God, with His presence, with His Spirit within you. Otherwise, these things look nice. It's a theory. Try doing it on your own. You're not supposed to do it on your own is the point. Because you cannot do it on your own. This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Some of the things we talked about, my God will supply all my needs, right? We talk about financial. But how does he do that? Would you get manna in this stage and age? No, right? But he does say something interesting. Look at the birds of the air. What happens? You know, I provide for them, right? But think about it. How does he provide for them? He allows them to go look for their own food, right? He allows them to fly, go from one place to the other. You know there are some birds that go across migratory 20,000 kilometers from north, north to south. They enjoy the world. They come and have different seasons, you know? God has provided everything you need for you to succeed. End of story. Let's go back to Nehemiah. How did Nehemiah build the gates? The king actually provided him with the timber. How did the king know to get the timber? Nehemiah asked him. He had no problems. God has given you your skill set. God has given you providence. God will give you ideas. God will make you a Nehemiah. How do you think he knew what to ask the king? Four months he prayed, by the way. My question is, are, are we willing to engage in God in that level? Are we engaged to go, God, I want to hear from you. I'm, I'm ready. Your wall will be built in 52 days. Be a wise builder. Here's what God has for you in your future. Because we, we always think, right, what is my future? Like, Everybody asks you when you're a kid, what is your future going to be like? What is our future as Christians? You will be with him. I think that's the most exciting one. You will be with him. How awesome is that? Now, I don't know about you, but I love being with my wife. Like, I really love it. COVID was the blessing in disguise. I, like, I have an excuse to have her for myself for three months. We will be with him forever. How amazing is that? His work in you will be complete. You're not done yet. So why judge yourself as if you're completely done and perfect? God has, he says, you, you're still work in progress. Paint is still wet, my friends. It's okay. But you don't stop, right? You're like 50% more. Do you stop? No, because you're, you, you're in God's timeline. This is the age of the church. We are here in this spirit to be the, 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 rock, the, the, the salt and the light of the world. You'll be like Jesus. That's exciting. You know, Jesus did promise. He said that, you know, if you are, greater works will you do than me. He says it. What did he do? He looked at the blind, they could see. He gave hope to the poor. He, he did everything that God told him to do. You will be like that. Question is, do you want to? You have to play to win, right? You have to play to win. How do you overcome? This is from Revelations. You know, it talks about at the end days and, and in there, and it says, you overcome by... Oops, sorry. You overcome by the blood of Jesus, which you just had. And then it says, you overcome by the word of your testimony. What is your testimony? What do you say? What comes out of your mouth? 
Think of Nehemiah. Here's what I, what I guarantee you, you need to do. If you study, meditate, and do it. If you hear my voice and do it. That's what God says. That's his promise. That's a promise. Hold on to the testimony of Jesus. What does the testimony of Jesus mean? What has God spoken to you in your life? What did Nehemiah look at? He looked at, what did God say about Israel? It's okay if you're not sure, by the way. Because there's enough promises in there to know that you can still go on. For example, you can even take the words, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And if you're having a struggle at work, that is your testimony of Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Your boss yells at you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Your voice goes like, well, you're stupid. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Well, I can't do this. I'm not losing weight enough. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. That's the testimony of Jesus. Right? Because that's what Jesus said you can. Communion and pray with God. What does prayer mean? I mean, we're, we're so special because we, we can pray in the name of Jesus and he's our intercessor. We don't need to say fancy prayers. And you know what? Nehemiah had one word just before the king asked him, what do you want? He prayed. What could he say? He could say, Lord, help me pray. Help me. There's no greater prayer than just two words. Help me, God. Maybe three. Help me, Jesus. There's no greater prayer than that. Is your problem a Goliath? And this is to me the most fascinating thing. You know, we always think about David and Goliath, right? We all know the story. It's the mighty big giant of the world against the armies of Israel, actually. And what did God use against Goliath? You could argue it's David. But guess what? A mighty big thing was brought down by a small pebble. Here's my thing for you. If God's with you, all you need is a pebble. You don't need a mighty army because <laughs> Saul had the mighty army and his trust was in the mighty army, right? Um, interesting. All David did was use whatever it's in your hand. Please use what's in your hand. So what is in your hand? What's in your hand today? Oops. Your pebble is your attitude. Your pebble is your attitude. What is your attitude? What does the Bible say about your attitude? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in what? In what? All. When you're joyful, give thanks, pray. When you're sad, give thanks, pray. When you're in trouble, give thanks, pray. When you feel like you can't even pray, give thanks, pray. For this is the will of Christ in you. Don't know the will of God? Hey, guess what? You just found it today. Now you can't say you don't know what God's will for your life is, can you? Can you honestly say you don't know what God's will for your life is? God has a plan for you. God loves you. That's really the crux of Nehemiah. You are very special to God, and He has a plan for you. Here's the thing. He stands at the door and knocks. Are you willing to let Him into your heart? Because some of you, I think, you know, might be discouraged right now, and you've closed your heart. It's hard. It's like, I've had enough, right? Some of you are saying like, well, you know, I've trusted God for 20 years, and nothing has happened. I want to say, you know, God's here. Um, If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here's your time to actually even say, look, you know, God, I need you. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I want to leave you with that. I, I, want, to, I want to pray for you right now. Um, as we pray, can I just invite the musicians to come as well? Let's just pray. Father, Father, I want to thank you for your love for us, for your goodness for us, Lord. I ask for restoration, Father. Forgive us if we have in some way just not heard you, or even if we have, we just can't believe that you love us, Lord. 
So the fa- Father, I just want to pray for the people out here who, or anyone who's listening, Father, that um, needs their heart restored. I pray that you allow them to hear you, that you uh, you open the doors for them. And for those of you who, who have not heard about Jesus, Father, I just ask that you visit them today. Be with them. I pray for your holy anointing over each and every one of us, Father. I pray that the words that have been spoken, Father, resonate with us and stay with us, Father. I pray that we continue in your presence. I pray that we fight the good fight, Lord Jesus. I pray that as we look at these challenges that come ahead, that we look at them with a joyful heart, Lord, and we say, Father, help me. I pray for every life here right now. I pray for your gifting in every person, Father. I call them to life. I call them to life and I say in Jesus' name, be all that God has called you to be. Be a Nehemiah in the world. Be a wise builder. Build your house upon the rock. Build your house upon Jesus in Jesus' name. Know that He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So Father, I thank you that you are our shepherd. We shall not want, Lord Jesus, because you have provided everything for us. And even when the storm comes, Lord, we shall declare the goodness of the Lord because you are truly good. And your mercies and love, they endure forever. Amen. You have been listening to a Petra Church recording. We hope that you have been blessed. For more information and resources, visit us at Petra.sg.